Hello and welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. I would like to thank everyone who supports the show on Patreon. Your contributions help to make the show sustainable. When you're ready to launch your next project, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so you should check out Linode at podcastinit.com slash Linode and get a $20 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for running your app. And now you can deliver your work to your users even faster with the newly upgraded 200 gigabit network in all of their data centers. If you're tired of cobbling together your deployment pipeline, then it's time to try out GoCD, the open source continuous delivery platform built by the people at ThoughtWorks who wrote the book about it. With GoCD, you get complete visibility into the life cycle of your software from one location. To download it now, go to podcastinit.com slash GoCD. Professional support and enterprise plugins are available for added peace of mind. You can visit the site at podcastinit.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the newsletter, and read the show notes. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, I would love to hear them. You can reach me on Twitter at podcastinit or email me at hosts at podcastinit.com. To help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes or Google Play Music. Tell your friends and coworkers and share it on social media. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Kenneth Wrights about his career in Python. So, Kenneth, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, Tobias. Uh, my name is Kenneth Wrights. I am the Python overlord at Heroku, which is a part of Salesforce, and I'm also a director, one of 13, at the Python Software Foundation. I am uh, known for making software that people use in the Python community, I suppose. And do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? Yes. Uh, the first time I saw it when I was a child, I used to play around with Linux a lot because my dad always had these Linux CDs and he used Linux. And uh, I remember installing some version of Linux. It was called uh, Caldera, I think. And it said booting or installing Python or something. And I remember that was the first time I saw the, the word Python and it stuck out to me. And then uh, actually being exposed to it properly was I went to school for CS. I dropped out after a year. I took the same semester twice. I'm not a classroom learner. Uh, I hate school. <laughs> Uh, but they, uh, the CS112 class that I took was a Python course. So that is what got me uh, kind of kick-started in the right direction. And I went from there to learning. I already knew some programming languages before that at a very rudimentary level, like C and Pascal and BASIC. Um, but I went from learning the rudimentary Python, um, uh, you know, ways to... Uh, going into PHP and starting to build a little bit of a freelancing career in uh, web development. And uh, I went down that road for a while, and then I did Java and Groovy and uh, some C Sharp. And, you know, I dove into all these languages, and I always did Python on the side. That was like my personal passion project, doing open source Python projects. And then eventually I was finally able to get a job doing Python full time, and that's when I was truly fulfilled and happy. So Python has always been my number one language, and it always will be. And how do you think that your experience on all of those other programming languages has informed and influenced the work that you do in Python? Um, I think my exposure to different languages definitely informs my decision making in the libraries that I make and the philosophies behind them. Uh, for example, my work at Heroku, um, I'm on the languages team, and the languages team is comprised of like five or six individuals that are like thought leaders in their respective communities. Uh, one for PHP, one for Ruby, one for Java, one for Node, one for Python. I'm probably missing one. Uh, uh, and we all get to discuss all the nuances of our languages and, and like the ecosystems and the packaging managers and stuff like that. So that gives me some tremendous insight into uh, the a proper way to approach certain problems, I think. And diving into all those other languages and using them in my history definitely makes me value the approach that Python takes because I value the design of Python above all else. If you look at Ruby, Ruby, you could say on paper, is a very similar language to Python. At its core, it has the same basic functionality as Python, but it's expressed in an opposite manner uh, where it has like opposite philosophical value and then you take that expression and you extend it out as to its logical conclusion and you end up with ruby and python they're like opposites of each other yet the same i think that that is uh something that's beautiful but at the same time i hate ruby and i i hate it because not because i think it's a bad language or that people that write it don't 
write it for the wrong reasons or anything like that. I, I think that when you get into the deep internals of like the way the object model works, you, you can't fit Ruby in your head. And that's what I really value about Python is that when you, you can fully encapsulate Python in your mind, and that is the, a testament to excellent design. And I think that that is both the work of uh, the PEP system, all the people who have contributed towards that and all the discussion and discourse that has taken place. And of course, the work of Guido himself and his foresight into the language. Yeah, there's definitely a very interesting dichotomy between Python and Ruby, because as you said, at the very surface level, they're similar because they're both very expressive and easy to get started with. You know, they have a one line hello world program, but there was a great visual that I saw one time where somebody had created a graph of the object hierarchy of the Ruby core library, and then the same for the Python library. And just visually seeing the two of them was very interesting because the Ruby one was this, you know, giant plate of spaghetti where everything was going everywhere and python was very sort of neat and hierarchical and easy to parse yes exactly because, yeah because ruby is very much designed by committee whereas python has guido as the bdfl so that it's a you know more centralized design with input from the committee and an ultimate arbiter of the final design as I grow older, I think I begin to appreciate hierarchy more and more. As long as you have someone who's wise at the top, I think that it's definitely generally a useful structure to have. <laughs> yeah, not to take the sort of metaphor too far, but it's, uh, you know, Python seems to have more of an oligarchy rather than a pure monarchy where Guido delegates a lot of his decision-making power to a lot of trusted individuals who have built up that trust by virtue of being part of the community and contributing to it for so long so that he doesn't have to spend as much of his time in the day-to-day -day operation of making sure that Python is developing in a strong and cohesive manner, but still at a high level understanding broadly where it's going and where it should be going. Yeah, and Matts, who is a, technically a coworker of mine, um, who I've met once, um, he's very nice, and he, I, I'm under the impression, and I might be wrong in this, but I'm under the impression that basically he and his team of like two or three people basically go away in a dark corner, and they just kind of, you know, fiddle away at Ruby, and then they just unveil the next version, and that's kind of how it works. I'm not sure if that's an accurate picture, but that's my impression. Yeah, the uh, overarching philosophy for Python is the Zen of Python, and from what I've been able to gather from my time working in Ruby, the sort of overarching philosophy for Ruby is the Miniswan. Matt's is nice, and so we are nice. Yes, yes. Miniswan. I, I haven't actually heard it spelled out before, but I definitely am familiar with that phrase. And bringing it back to the work that you've been doing with Python, one of the overarching themes of the projects that you've released is the idea of making them for humans. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate a bit on how that came to be a focus for you and how that informs the way that you design and write your code. And also if you can just uh, elaborate on how that manifests as well. Certainly. Um, it's a double-edged sword because there is a small subset of the community that does not like that phrase. They find it to be very... Um, what's the right word, uh, self-righteous, I think, where it kind of has an inherent tone of other people aren't building things for humans and I am, or the people who use the phrase that aren't me are. Um, and that I see their point of view and I don't disagree completely, but at the same time, that's not the intention behind the phrase in any way, shape or form. Um, I'll tell you the story. Basically, I started building requests. I was building a... Uh, another library that needed to send requests, basically. So it was started off as just a little module inside of this other package I was making, and I decided to split it out into its own thing. And uh, much to my surprise, people actually started to pay attention to that thing, and I so I started uh, uh, putting a lot of work into it. But the original name was not Request HTTP for Humans. The original name was Request HTTP for Python that doesn't suck, uh, <laughs> which uh, was a testament to the design goals for the project. I basically felt like every possible HTTP option at the time sucked. 
and I wanted to build one that didn't. And that was my um, goal. And it went through like three or four different iterations before I finally arrived at HTTP for humans. And the intention is to make a statement that this is something that is cultivated and designed for humans. And there's actually, there's this great book I have called The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. And he talks about the design of everyday objects like spoons and forks and like, you know, pitchers. And he, there's this aspect to his um, ideology of, of design that he calls human design. And it's basically you design things for humans. And that's kind of what I want to embody in my software is like, this is something that is to be interacted with by people not by machines because it's really easy to approach a problem see the problem set that you have in front of you and then just kind of like cobble a solution together that is very functional and works on paper perfectly but then is not very friendly and elegant and designed to use and i i don't actually consider myself to be a good programmer i consider myself to be a good designer disguised as a programmer and that is kind of the approach I take to the software that I write is that I'm designing things. Um, it's all about abstraction and design. And uh, that's, that is the, that's where the phrase came about. And that's kind of the philosophy that it embodies. And other people take it and they use it for their software. About 50% of the time, they'll ask me beforehand if it's okay. And the other 50% of the time, they'll just do it. And I see it spreading into other communities. Like there's Git for humans and, and there's there's all kinds of stuff for humans that's outside of Python. And that's very um, validating and exciting to see that I've been able to kind of impact the world in that way in a positive manner. But uh, at the same time, it's very um, humbling too, because it's like, you know, it's not because of me, it's because of all the people that support and encourage this design, right? Like they value things that are built well. And that is the thing that I have faith in is the, the people that have good taste effectively. So that's the people I'm targeting. And that's the people that I want to build things for. And I want us all to have good taste. And I want us to come together in good taste. And what are some of the projects that you're most proud of and that you think have had the biggest impact on the Python community? Requests is definitely the one that you know, I'm most proud of and has had the biggest impact. I don't think it's possible, at least in within the realms of Python, to have a bigger impact than Requests has, which is very humbling and I'm very thankful. And it's really hard to speak on, honestly, because it's it's overwhelming how much attention that project has received. So I just won't speak on it at all. <laughs> um, I'm very proud of the Hitchhiker's Guide to Python. I just wrote an outline of all the different topics I wanted to cover for a kind of tribal knowledge dictionary of Python. And I wrote the parts that were important to me and then a hundred other people contributed. And then someone approached me and said, hey, can we turn this into a book? And then she, toiled away for a year and turned it into an O'Reilly book. And now it's an O'Reilly book and it's all the proceeds go to Django girls. And it's like this thing. And I'm, so I'm really proud of that project and it receives like 17,000 views a day, uh, the website. So it really helps impact a lot of people's lives. And, uh, I'm able to, with both that site and the request site, which receives a similar amount of traffic, I'm able to deliver messages to the community. For example, on the home page of both, I have like a, a mantra that's like Python 3 is the new best practice. You have like 19 months left to upgrade before end of life. You know, this like not necessary or really relevant to requests, but like it's an appropriate place to put it. So I I do that. Uh, and then the, the last project that I think has the potential for a great impact on the community is pipenv. Um, which is my latest project in Passion. Um, it is a new package manager that fits a new space. It has no competition, really. The closest thing to it is PIP Tools, which we actually depend on. And one of the, the core maintainer of PIP Tools is also a core maintainer of PIPEMV. So we're all friends and we're working together. And PIPEMV seeks to utilize a new standard called PIPFile to replace requirements.txt for application deployment. 
and basically give you a streamlined dependency workflow effectively. And it gives you a lot of other tools like Flake 8 checking and um, you know dev prod uh, separation in one file. And uh, you just, just go to pipamp.org and you can learn more about it. It's, uh, it's really quite a nice project and it's being officially endorsed by python.org now as the recommended tool for instead of using pip directly because pip is kind of a lower level tool pip env is kind of like the more user-friendly thing that actually does what what you want to do as opposed to what you need to do if that makes sense yeah i had come across pip tools a while ago and really liked the ability for being able to separate the high level dependencies that you care about from the actual pinned dependencies that you need to be able to have repeatable installations and it really echoed with my experience that i had had working in ruby and the gem file and the gem file.lock for being able to do that same kind of idea of this is what i care about these are the packages and the versions and then actually compile that you know, at, at build time so that you make sure that what you're using in development matches what's in production because the standard practice of just pip installing a bunch of things then issuing pip freeze and catting that out to a file can very quickly get very messy when you're not quite sure what packages you actually installed originally, which ones came as transitive dependencies, and especially when you have churn in those packages where you say, okay, now I want to remove this package, but I don't know which other dependencies came with it, so it just really starts to clutter up your workspace. And so being able to have a very high-level and user-friendly tool to give you that capability and, as you said, separate out the production and development and test dependencies is is very valuable and i've started using it for all of my personal projects and excellent i'm working on starting to introduce it at work as well yeah and i i guess i should mention that that is the main sales pitch for pip env is that you only specify what you need and then it will generate what you uh you know all of the um transitive dependencies that you have so you can say i need flask and then in your lock file it'll say that you need flask uh jinja 2 um it's dangerous and, and all those things with the latest versions if you specified you know latest version so it will actually resolve your dependency graph and pip will not do that currently now the new version of pip pip 10 which is going to come out i guess in the next couple of months will have a resolver built into it so this is a situation that is improving but pip env gives you this functionality today and it'll give it to you in a much more pleasant manner than pip will ever. So ideally we can both be friends and pip is part of pip env. So uh, I definitely encourage anyone who's interested in having a better pip workflow to check it out. It also creates and manages your virtual environments for you. So you don't have to think or worry about them at all anymore. Uh, they're just kind of uh, transparent. Uh, you just do pip pip env install and it finds the pip file and it just creates a, vir a, pip, a virtual env for you and it'll automatically um, invoke commands uh, when you do pip env run in from the virtual environment and you can do a shell and it's uh, it's just a really great tool. So we put a tremendous amount of work into it and um, it's been very well received so far. So I, there's a screencast available on the website if you want to get a quick download of, of what it does. It's like two minutes long. So. Yeah, I like too that it automatically incorporates the package hashes so that if uh, somebody oh, yeah. accidentally uploads a new package with the same version number, you won't accidentally download it. I forgot about that. It's basically like every best practice that there is baked into one tool magically. So what you're saying is, is the I'm trying to rehash it. Effectively, what we do is for every dependency that you have, including your transitive dependencies, we will actually go out to the cheese shop and fetch the MD5 or the SHA-256 hashes of every release of that version so that it'll work on multiple platforms. So it's say if you require Django 161, which is a version I just made up, let's say they have three different tarballs available for that. We have a wheel, a tarball, and maybe like a Windows package or something like that. That was just some arbitrary situation. Uh, it'll capture all three of those SHAs and put them in there and then it'll verify when you're installing that it matches those SHAs. And if it doesn't, it'll raise an exception. So you know always that you're getting exactly in production what you are using in development and that everything matches. And uh, so not only do your version numbers match, but the exact bytes of what you're installing match. And that is very important for dev prod parity and for production use. 
And now going in the other direction, you have a number of high profile projects that a number of people are aware of and have used, but what are some of the ones that you've authored, which are relatively unknown, but that you think people should uh, be aware of and would benefit from using more often? Um, there's two projects that I think could use more attention that I, and when I say that, what I mean is I think that they're universally useful and that more people would use them if they were aware of them. And they are Maya, which is daytime for humans and records, which is sequel for humans. Uh, Maya is effectively, if you've ever worked with time or date times in Python, you are, you know, that it is uh like the seventh circle of dante's hell and (laughs) is the most confusing thing in the universe uh and it's not because of python it's not python's fault it is time's fault time is a very confusing thing to encapsulate in an api and in a computer in general so uh i spent a tremendous amount of time designing an api that strives to instill best practices into the way you handle datetime objects by making them always UTC, for example. So these aren't for scientific uses. They're for, it's for humans, so it's human time. For example, you would not want to use UTC time if you were going to be doing scientific calculations because it varies second to second every year or something. It's, it's not scientifically accurate. You would want to use some kind of ISS standard for the time. But Maya exists to make it very pleasant and easy to translate from time zone to time zone, to do different algebras, to convert from a given time to English, uh, from English to a given time. You can give it any arbitrary string and it will attempt to read it. It'll, It'll parse it as if it was human text. So you give it human text and it will parse that. Or you can give it machine text and it will parse that. So you don't have to write any parsing code whatsoever. So if, if you're grabbing something from a website that's publicly accessible, you can just say dot uh, when and it will automatically grab the, it'll make a date time object appropriately. And if you're, it's coming from a machine, you just do dot parse and it will automatically parse it accurately. Uh, and it will automatically generate and receive all the official time standards uh, synchronously. So there's R. I have to look up the names, but there's different R RFCs and ISO standards for date times. And uh, like the standard library is only capable of generating and parsing a few of those. So this one does all of them. In addition to that, at PyCon this year we did a sprint and we added very complicated class. That's very easy to use, but it's for doing extremely advanced time series algebra effectively. So you can do like bit flip operations. So imagine if you had a calendar with different time slots that are reserved, you could invert that for free in available slots. You could quantize it so that you could say if something, if an appointment starts at like 914, you could automatically adjust it to 915. Uh, It has a lot of advanced functionality like that, but that's kind of beyond the basic usage. Uh, The basic usage alone is useful enough. So that's Maya. Uh, SQL for Humans Records is really cool. And basically, SQL Alchemy is a fantastic, fantastic, really engineered library that is way over my head. And I have this thing in my company where we just pass around SQL queries to each other for our data warehouse to get business data. And sometimes I just want to stick that into my application. And I don't want to use um, PsychoPG2 to uh, to do that. I want to use SQL Alchemy. And so, because I want connection pooling, I want to have a pleasant interface to the data that I'm retrieving. Uh, I want to be able to access it in a, in a pleasant way. You know, I want it to have a human API. And that's with... SQL Alchemy directly to do all of those things, you know, it takes like, it can take 30 lines of code, but like, if you really do it right, it takes like 130 lines of code. So that's what records is. It's it's like this really tiny thing that makes, uh, gives you the ability to do parameterized queries in any SQL language in a standard manner. And uh, that's all it does. And it gives you results back as an iterable, um, that return is a 
it's like a name tuple that's also a dictionary. So you can do columns as integers, or you can get, reference them by the column name or by the attribute name. So they're very flexible and uh, they don't take up any memory because they use slots. And uh, it's just a great little library. So I encourage everyone to check that out. It's great if you just ever want to run SQL, basically. And it connects to anything that's, that um, SQL Alchemy connects to, which is basically every database ever. So. And one of the other projects that I came across while I was preparing for the show that I think deserves an honorable mention that's not anything executable is the repository that you created. I think it's called Dreams for Python, where oh, wow, you that's encourage old. people to just... Uh, create a pull request and just submit a readme file of things that they would like to see happen in Python, you know, aspirational ideas that are likely never actually going to be included in the runtime. But it's just interesting to see some of the stuff that people have put in there, because it gives you new ideas and uh, understanding of the different ways that people are using the language and the ways that people would like to use the language. Yeah, it's really cool to look through that repo, which I totally forgot existed until just now. (laughs) Because like Alex Gaynor and other prolific people for example have contributed to it so you can see what their values and their goals are for the community uh i I think that that's of value and outside of the code that you write what are some of your personal missions for the software industry in general and the python community in particular i don't know if i actually have any specific goals for the python community other than what i'm doing currently um i'm contributing to the python software foundation and i'm excited about my work there When I joined, I thought that I was going to be like helping to contribute to the sustainability of the organization and help them figure things out in that area. But they have it pretty well covered. So I'm actually kind of taking more of the role of an internal advisor, if you will, where, you know, people will just say thing. I'll just like make sure to say the right thing at the right time to make sure that we are internally aligned with PEP20 effectively. And that's kind of what I do within the organization. And so I want to contribute in that way continuously if I can. And um, I want to keep contributing code. I want to help drive best practice adoption by like getting people to move to three as soon as possible because I want to see Python be a cohesive unit and not two separate communities. I don't want to see a two community and a three community. I want to see Python be a community. And that was a big message that I was delivering a few years ago. And I don't think it's a necessary one anymore, which is good. So I think we're definitely moving in the right direction there. So I just want to kind of continue to foster that message of unity. Like with type hinting coming down the pipe, I want to see us like embracing that and not bickering over like, oh, this is a bad idea and stuff like that. I want us to to love the language that we are given. And um, that's the way I want to contribute. Yeah, it's funny thinking back about the Python 2 versus Python 3 divide, because when I first started this podcast, I think it's been, yeah, it's been over two years now. It's almost three years coming up in a few months. And a lot of the earlier interviews, one of the questions I liked to fit in was the idea of, you know, uh, you know, how much effort was it to port to Python 3 or when are you going to port to Python 3 or just working in that question in some manner into the discussion because it was a lot more pertinent at the time, whereas these days a lot of that has dropped to a much lower level of background noise because of the fact that so many people are doing Python 3 only projects or have already gone through the work of making their libraries work across Python 2 and Python 3. Yeah, nowadays it's it's if you start a new project, it's definitely supposed to be three. And if if you're running a two project, it's effectively a legacy code base, and that's fine. You know, you you don't. There's no need to update to three if your code base is seven years old and it's going to be deprecated in two years. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, th- I think the only time it's come up recently was. Uh week or two ago i was uh, interviewing another project and they were still on python 2 and working on trying to upgrade to python 3 so i brought that up briefly but uh it, yeah it, it was much less of a focus of the overall conversation so it's definitely interesting to see how that dialogue has evolved over the past couple of years at least it's not pearl six we're not <laughs> we, we, which, which, which they did finally ship they did albeit, but it ruins uh, what on, on the order of 10 years too late it, yeah it ruined their community and uh from what i understand and 
I I was I saw a potential future for Python three doing that to us, and luckily it didn't. We got through it, so I'm very thankful. Because I would hate to live in a world where I'm forced to write another language for a living. That would be tragic for me. Yeah, it's uh, Python definitely has a very uh, sort of strong sticking power with all the people who have interacted with it. I'm learning Go right now. I'm, I'm, I haven't started yet, but I'm about to learn Go for work because if we're starting on the languages team, any new projects, they want them to be a, a universal language that we can all speak. And so our like Esperanto is Go apparently. So we all have to learn Go and uh, I'm excited to try it. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, I wish we could have done Python. But that's not <laughs> that's not fair because it's one of the languages uh, on the team. So we have to pick something that is not represented on the team. So Go it right. is. And Go is used heavily in the organization. So it's just a natural fit. So then we could offload it to another team if we need to, uh, you know, to, for the maintenance. And it's, it's a good uh, infrastructure language for our organization. And I think a lot of people probably have that where, like, if you're going to move off of Python for any reason, for any project, Go is probably one of the better choices out there. Yeah, it seems like there's a big divide between Go and Rust as the language that people would want to land on if they were to leave Python. Yeah, Rust is definitely gaining traction. I think Rust has more traction in the Ruby community and Go has more traction in the Python community, from what I can tell. Yeah, I think that has to do largely with the fact that Go, again, was very much you know top-down designed and has a very small surface area, whereas it seems that Rust has a lot more of a broad API. And there were also a number of people from the Ruby community who were heavily involved in uh, bringing it up to the 1.0 release. Yeah, and a lot of the prolific Ruby developers do Rust now. So on the topic of new language runtimes and uh, sort of moving away from Python, what are some of the biggest gaps that you see in the overall tool chest for Python developers and the Python community as a whole? Um, nothing really comes to mind at the moment, except for something that's always stood out to me is the building of distributable executables. Um, there's lots of tools out there like PyExe, CXFreeze. Uh, there's a new one called Briefcase from the P a Beware project. Um, there's, there's a plethora of these tools available, but they're, I haven't used Briefcase personally, so I can't attest to that one. But all the other ones are very difficult to use, and they're all different, and there's no standard, and it's, it's kludgy. And Go has a great story for building executables. Um, so I would love to see Python really unify around, you know, because if you're building a Python app, you want to be able to ship it to customers, and you don't want to ship... Python code and a Python interpreter, you want to ship a .exe or a .app or a, a, a Linux executable that you can run on a Mac or a Linux executable that you can run in Linux. You know what I mean? And that's that's what I want to see us do. And I, I don't know if we'll ever get there, but I think that it would greatly help the community because I think that a lot more people care about that. The people who are empowered to build that software don't care about it. But the people who would utilize it, I think, is a very large number of people. So because like Dropbox, for example, I don't, they the command line application or not the command line, the desktop application, at least historically, was written in Python and like pure Python. And they they used all those tools I mentioned earlier to ship it. And they had to put a tremendous amount of infrastructure and effort and time and have like a full time engineer maintain that stack and that should not be necessary that should be like a primitive in the language in my opinion so that that's my take yeah, and i think that one of the challenges that faces python which go kind of skirted around is the fact that a lot of non-trivial python applications pull in a lot of system dependencies in the form of C libraries or calling out to other binaries in the system, whereas a lot of the Go projects that are shipped as a single distributable are purely Go, and they don't actually rely on any other languages to be able to link in. So that makes it simpler for them to statically link all of the code and provide it as a single binary, whereas a lot of Python applications will require 
you know, C libraries, as well as the full Python runtime, which is a little bit heavier weight than the Go runtime. So it, it complicates the issue, but I definitely think that it's a worthwhile goal and one that is potentially achievable, as you said, depends on people who are motivated enough to actually put in the work. Yeah, if you want to suck in C dependencies, they have to be statically built. And uh, it's that's a challenge in and of itself if you ever want to do anything of merit. But uh, I think that there's an opportunity for PyPy uh, to to kind of capitalize on this because most PyPy code is pure Python. Uh, so people could build PyPy apps and build executables out of them potentially. So that's that's a potential future that I see because I see PyPy as a potential best practice in the long term future default Python interpreter for people instead of C Python. I don't think that'll happen anytime soon, but I think if the project's successful in its goals, that will be what happens. Yeah, one of the dreams that I saw while I was browsing a repository was somebody stating that they wanted to see more of pure Python web servers where they were using PyPy with the software transactional memory running twisted in place of people using Nginx and UISGI for serving up their applications, and I thought that was interesting. Yes, that's very performant. And... What are some of the ambitions that you have for future projects or goals for yourself and your work going forward? Uh, at the moment, none. Uh, I, I kind of work in a very cyclical, flowy type of way where inspiration comes and strikes and I just kind of roll with it. Um, Pipend was the last thing that I was inspired by and it happened like seven or eight months ago and I put my head down and I worked on it for two months straight and then I took a break for many months and then for another month I just did nothing but pip bands and uh, there it is today and uh, at the moment I don't have anything in my mind to work on so that's unfortunate but at the same time in in due time the ideas will come I'm sure uh, it's also nice to focus on other things. I have lots of other hobbies, so it's good to take breaks. Yeah, it's definitely very freeing once you get through a large body of work and you can actually set it aside for a little while and stop thinking about it because that's what allows for the room for new inspiration to take root. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think I don't go to as many conferences as I used to. I That's when I was really pushing a lot of work. I think talking to developers is what really seeds ideas in me. So um, I'm, I might start traveling more soon. And if I do do that, then maybe I'll start getting more ideas. But we'll see. I built a lot of software. And I honestly, if you were to you know, pay me a bunch of money to come up with an idea tonight, I don't really know if I could do it. Well, fortunately for you, I don't have any spare money to give you. So you're, <laughs> you're off the hook. <laughs> I could use some. That would, that's unfortunate. <laughs> And if you weren't working with Python or software in general, what do you think you'd be doing instead? Um, that's a great question. I I almost committed my life to being a drummer. Uh, I've been playing the drums for 15 years, and that was my biggest life passion before programming. So it's possible I would have gone down the musician route. And I am a musician, um, but it's a hobby, not a career. So that... Uh, I, I also do photography, so that's probably a better option for a career. I think there's more money and stability in photography than there is in drumming. <laughs> so probably in the artistry field, I would say, would be my best bet. And are there any other topics that you think we should talk about before we start to close out the show? Um, nothing really comes to mind. I I know that PyCon 2018 is selling their tickets now, and if you want to get a ticket, you need to buy it early. So go get your tickets now, because they always sell out every year. And it's going to be in Cleveland this year. Cleveland? Yeah, Cleveland. And uh, it's going to be great. So it's my favorite week of the year, and I highly encourage anyone who hasn't gone, if you're having mixed feelings about it, to just spend the money and go and if you don't have the money apply for a grant and try to go anyway because i i really stretched myself thin super 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 thin going to my first PyCon, and it changed my life forever so i can't recommend it enough yeah i'll second that it's uh 
been a great deal of fun every time I've gone. I think I've gone for the past three years now, and I'm planning on going again for 2018. I'm going to be sharing a booth with Mike Kennedy from Talk Python to me again. So excellent. Uh, come on by and say hi. Um, so for anybody who wants to follow what you're up to and keep in touch, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. Sounds good. And uh, for my pick this week, I'm going to choose a book that I just borrowed from the library and started reading called Algorithms to Live By. I think it might have been mentioned in, by other people on the show before, but I've heard a lot of good things about it. And so far it is uh, living up to the expectations. So I'll leave that as my pick for this week and I'll pass it to you, Kenneth. Do you have anything you'd like to mention? Excellent. Um, I have grand esoteric interests, and I usually would have picked something like that, but I have something very relevant to the audience that I would like to share, and it is a book called The Linux Programming Interface. It's expensive. It costs $100, but it is the most profound resource I have ever seen on Linux in, in my life. It is. It explains every detail of everything that you've ever encountered in a Linux system to the C calls, and I like I've just glancing through it. I have learned so much about processes and time, and like I had no idea the depth at which that operating system operates. So if you work with Linux in a professional level, I cannot recommend this book enough. And if you have any kind of an education expense system at your company, get them to buy it for you because you will benefit, and your company will benefit greatly from this book. Yeah, it's definitely one I'll have to take a look at because I spend way too much of my time at the Linux command line trying to uh, get systems to do what I tell them to. <laughs> yeah, this is great because it, it like explains how, like, I didn't even know that this could happen, but child processes can be abandoned. Like, their parents can die, but the child process can still be alive, and it, it describes that process and, like, how to retrieve, retrieve them and, like, what, what their IDs are in that situation and all the different uh signals that are sent and it's it's so great it's it's really nice and it has like a table of all the signals that you can send to different processes like i've i've encountered these things in my professional work and i know like about sig term and sig weight and all those but like i've never just seen a table of all of them you know like this is just like a great guide it's so good all right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join me and talk about the work that you've been doing with and for the Python community. So I appreciate that. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. You as well. Thank you so much for having me. 